Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Our agenda for tonight will begin with a brief introduction to Zoom, followed by Dr. Carl Stoffer introducing our topic and the guest speakers who will be presenting during this webinar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and answers, which will be moderated by Carl. After the Q&A portion has concluded, I will share a few announcements related to the Zare Institute and the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, and then the webinar will be closed out with remarks. We encourage you to stay for as much of the webinar as you can, but please know that there will be a recording of this webinar posted on the Zare Institute's website and YouTube channel by early next week if you'd like to watch it again or share it with others. Just a brief disclaimer, we do have a secure platform, but in case of disruption, do not attempt to exit Zoom. Instead, close your laptop or turn off your device immediately. If this happens, we will resume the webinar again after 10 minutes. For today's webinar, please acquaint yourself with the Q&A button and dialog box that pops up with it. Carl will be using that feature to moderate the Q&A portion after the presentation. You will likely see a raise hand feature, but please do not use that as we will not be able to monitor it during today's webinar. If you're having a technical issue, please feel free to send a message to me using the chat box. Again, please use the Q&A button for questions um, and use the chat feature to ask questions regarding the technology or your viewer experience. Thank you and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Now I'm going to pass to Dr. Soffer to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Maggie, and um, welcome to each one of you who are part of the webinar with us um, this evening. We appreciate your presence and are looking forward to the interaction and engagement that will go forward uh, in this next hour and a half. I also want to thank our guests, and I'll be introducing them in just a bit. It's a real privilege to have uh, both um, Monte Data and Bob Spires with us. Let's look at the subject matter. We are exploring um, new territory in some ways uh, with restorative justice, and this is exciting because I think we want to think about what are the uh, what are the places, the frontier sort of uh, places that we can begin to think about um, the multitude of creative and innovative applications that could be made. Um, from restorative justice, maybe not as a practice, but even the values, uh, the principles, and the frames that restorative justice may bring to um, issues of justice in general, and the, and the definitions and the satisfaction of justice in general. And so just real delighted to open this conversation up um, with our two guests on trust and civic engagement, uh, specifically, around the connections to human trafficking in the United States. So very, a very specific focus, very important focus of justice. And I'm looking forward to not only finding out more about this topic, but then engaging in some of the questions you might have uh, for our guests around <clears throat> what it would be like to turn a restorative justice lens on this incredibly important subject matter. So let me introduce a little bit of our two guests who are going to be with us, and um, we'll go from there. Dr. Bob Spires is an Associate Professor of Graduate Education at the University of Richmond, um, not far from us, our neighbors, coming to UR, uh, University of Richmond, from Valdosta State University in 2018. His research has been focusing on grassroots anti-trafficking NGOs. Uh, that use education to address social mobility and the exploitation of vulnerable children and youth. Um, Dr. Spires serves on the board of Love Without Boundaries, an international NGO that provides diverse programming for disadvantaged children around the world. And um, we're so looking forward to hearing from Dr. Spires and his experience in both research and work uh, in places like Thailand, Cambodia, Hong Kong, China, India and Uganda. Welcome, uh, Dr. Spires. It's good to have you uh, with good us. Good to be here. Mantai Data. Um, Narayan Data is an associate professor of political science at the University of Richmond. Born and raised in Los Angeles, California, Mantai received his bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley, taught English overseas in both Japan and South Korea. 
Throughout a decade of research, he has used quantitative research methods to understand the source and impact of human trafficking more fully. He's a big fan of mindfulness. Um, Monty now incorporates mindfulness-based practices in the classroom, which I think is amazing and is, and in his community work. Uh, Dr. Dada received his PhD in political science from UC Davis, and we have so appreciated the relationship that we have had with Monty uh, specifically, and welcoming Bob into that connection uh, between our two institutions, and specifically the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding and the Summer Peacebuilding Institutes, and the times we have been graced with Monty's presence uh, uh, in that process. So with these two very um, able and um, experienced uh, folk in our midst, I'm gonna turn over uh, our time and let them give some inputs. And then I'm encouraging each one of us who are in the webinar, uh, if you have questions that um, arise, uh, please feel free to put them into the Q and um, A um, section or, or hit the icon at the bottom of your screen. And um, you can do that at any time but we will field those questions at the end of our time together. We'll leave ample time for that. I turn it over to the two of you. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you, we're excited to be here um, and excited to be able to talk about uh, a topic that is uh, a passion project for both of us. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very proud that uh, Dr. Dada has been the glue to connect me to this uh, CJP, which is uh, just a, a fantastic organization. So uh, today we're gonna we're gonna go over a few things. Here here is the agenda for our presentation. We're gonna talk about some of the definitions um, of human trafficking, and uh, you'll see very quickly that it becomes a, a complex topic. Um, those definitions have led to some uh, serious debates uh, around the topic across the globe, um, and those debates have then led to uh, some, some challenges with, with trying to estimate human trafficking, estimate its prevalence, its size, its scope. We're gonna look at uh, just briefly a few organizations that do work um, uh, in this field. And you'll, you'll notice very quickly that there's a diversity of, of the kinds of work that are, that are done in anti-trafficking. Um, that work and our connections to a variety of organizations has led us to this interest in this research project on trust um, or the lack thereof in many cases um, in the anti-trafficking field. And then finally, we'll wrap up with those connections more specifically to uh, restorative justice. So to begin, uh, Dr. Dada is gonna talk a little about the definitions. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's really a joy to be connected to the Zero Institute um, and the CJP community, just hello to all my brothers and sisters out there in the CJP universe, uh, it's a gift to be in the space. Um, definitionally, uh, when we think about human trafficking, uh, you've probably seen images in the news or maybe you've seen movies like Taken and uh, you have a lot of uh, sort of associations with trafficking. But, but in terms of definitions, one definition that we really like to begin with is from the League of Nations. And back in 1926, the League of Nations was looking at the issue of modern slavery and they defined it in an economic sense, uh, calling it the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. The idea that essentially a, a slave is a tool of another human being. Um, and then later in the United, in 1956, uh, the League of Nations had been disbanded, but that slavery convention carried on under the UN. And in 1956, the UN updated that definition to include, importantly, the phenomenon of forced marriage um, and to allow for more uh, protections for, for women's rights. Um, so for the league's definition, um, that was uh, broadened. And in 2000, uh, the United Nations included the term trafficking in persons and omitted references to forced marriage from the UN's 1956 definition. So uh, this was very politicized. Um, why would you take out references to forced marriage if that was a contribution made uh, 
all the way back at the 1950s. Well, that's that's the global politics of the politics of the United Nations. Um, so the terminology was changed a bit. So we now call it uh, trafficking in persons. Uh, many countries today don't call it necessarily modern slavery, although I do. Um, and in the the year 2000, all of this was changed in the, the UN's Palermo Protocol. Um, but then back in 2013, the UN once again revisited the theme of forced marriage and once again included it as part of their definition of modern slavery. Uh, another uh, important way of thinking about definitions comes from the United States. And in the year 2000, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act or the TVPA really put the United States on the map in terms of naming and addressing human trafficking here in the USA. Uh, the language of the TVPA mirrored that of the Palermo Protocol. Um, but one phrase that has been very uh, useful from the TVPA has been that the mechanisms of enslavement include the, the phrase force, fraud, or coercion. A person can be forced to enslavement. They can be pushed into enslavement through fraud or coercion. And the TVPA importantly made it easier for US uh, lawmakers and for uh, legislators to really put this on the books um, as a way to begin to prosecute human trafficking cases in the United States um, and to begin to offer protections under the law to victims of human trafficking. And even for some trafficking victims, giving them the, the recourse to have uh, not only legal protection, but in some cases eventually to uh, even confront their, their offenders and, and begin to, to have dialogues potentially even on reparations. So that's a little bit of definitions. Ah, and then uh, importantly for the, the TVPA, um, if there's a, a language to the TVPA that has been adopted, uh, the United States Congress has mandated every year that the US Department of State produce a trafficking and persons report or a tip report. Uh, this is a screenshot of the 20th edition. And so the tip report has been out for 20 years now. And if there's a, a, a phrase that's very, very uh, common with the language of the tip report, it's the language of the three Ps. And what the US government has been doing for years now is uh, basically evaluating and even ranking countries around the world in terms of how effective they are at protecting victims of human trafficking, at prosecuting the bad guys, and at preventing the phenomenon of human trafficking from arising in the United States, the three Ps. Uh, a fourth P that has been now mentioned a lot in the, the trafficking discourse is what about partnership? What are governments, for example, doing with non-government organizations, with local stakeholders, in trying to build this world where we can enforce uh, mechanisms to protect victims of human trafficking. Politically, there, there's a, a, a bit of controversy sometimes with the TIP report because this is the United States. And the United States is a country onto its own. And we know the United States has a lot of internal problems um, with race and justice. And some people say, well, what gives the United States the moral authority to say it can evaluate trafficking in persons around the world? But be that as it may, uh, the US government has been consistently evaluating global standards of, of figuring out what countries are doing a good job and not so good of a job in uh, fighting trafficking and protecting the victims. So that's that's really led, um, you know, this, this combination of the politicization of uh, trafficking, the influence of the United States um, and its it's sort of taking a lead role in truly evaluating the trafficking or anti-trafficking efforts of countries around the world. Um, and even, uh, you know, applying sanctions to some of those countries based on their um, uh, abilities to address trafficking. It has really uh, stirred up quite a few major uh, debates. Um, some of those debates are around this, these, these terminologies, right? That uh, uh, for one, we see a, a, a contrast between the discussion of human trafficking versus modern slavery. Some countries, particularly the United Kingdom, uh, prefers to use the term uh, modern slavery 
uh, elsewhere, trafficking in persons or human trafficking. And what we see is the challenge. Uh, it, slavery tends to, to, to come with it some uh, definitional weight, right? We, we, we tend to, uh, in general, be able to identify slavery, uh, whereas uh, there are many more gradations of exploitation that uh, are really difficult to fit into um, that, that mindset of what slavery looks like. Um, enslavement, um, we sort of have those pictures in our minds, and often the, the realities of human trafficking victims don't really match up with that. Um, number one, there are um, there are often sort of gradations of, of what that exploitation looks like depending on um, the economic sector. For instance, in migrant labor, domestic work, and these kinds of, of, of areas, exploitation can often be a very gray area. Um, debt bondage is another where, um, where it becomes difficult to know how much a migrant labor in, laborer is indebted to their employer, and thus, are they being exploited? How much are they being exploited? So when you when you export that around the world in the various contexts, various cultural definitions, um, it becomes very difficult to encapsulate what is human trafficking and what is not human trafficking. Um, and so you can imagine that that. Um, that that uh, that that challenge there um, makes it even more difficult for policymakers, for law enforcement, for anti-trafficking organizations working to prevent trafficking or prosecute traffickers. Um, it adds many many layers of complexity to the issue, and then we have this uh, this debate between sort of past definitions and understandings of slavery, historic slavery versus present day conditions. And you'll see quite a bit of debate between sort of historians and social scientists over uh, human trafficking and slavery being either the same or different. Um, for, for one, uh, human, human trafficking differs from historic slavery, particularly in, the, in terms of the African slave trade, because we're, we're talking about something that is uh, condoned and legal under a colonial power, right? It is, uh, it is something that, that is done on a much wider scale and essentially with the support of the state. Whereas human trafficking often uh, looks different, right? It's uh, more often individual actors, opportunistic people, often uh, in desperate situations themselves who then become exploiters of others in desperate situations. Um, you'll see historians also criticize the, uh, the, the, the conflating of the two because they'll say, you know, if you look back at antebellum slavery here in the, uh, in the South, we're talking about someone who is, who is forced into bondage. They're there for life. They're there, they're, their families are, um, are, are in bondage as well. So this isn't something with, a, with an end in sight. Whereas human trafficking, we, we've seen varying amounts of, uh, of research on this, but we tend to see um, uh, information that's, that points to that human trafficking victims today are in much more short-term types of exploitation. So one year, even, even less than a year sometimes, sometimes longer, uh, but on average, we're not seeing lifetimes of bondage in the way that we might have seen it um, in, uh, you know, several hundred years ago. Um, and then in terms of scale, right, when you're looking at um, the Atlantic slave trade with millions of Africans brought across the Atlantic uh, Ocean, Certainly there are millions uh, of people that are exploited, but not in such a formalized and organized manner. Um, when you think about the number of ports in, a, in an, any given um, uh, city, including airports, right, land border crossings, um, uh, especially in places around the world where those borders are very porous, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to really wrap your head around what the scale is. What kind of scale are we talking about? Um, and the fact that slavery is essentially outlawed in every country 
in the world means that uh, that dynamic is different around the world as well. No country is saying that they approve of human trafficking at this point, um, but, uh, but, but very few are able to say that there isn't any occurring in, within their borders. Um, and then the last big debate that has really uh, spurred in, the, in, in probably the last 20 years especially would be this question of uh, willful or uh, prostitution and sex work as a choice versus sex trafficking as a form of exploitation. And you can imagine the gradation between that being very complicated, right? Uh, you've got uh, entire interest groups that are uh, about empowering sex workers and offering them, you know, the same kinds of workers rights that they, you might find in other sectors. And then you've got others on the other side of that debate saying that no one truly chooses sex work that it is, it is out of force or it is out of lack of other better choices. And so um, we see these, these three giant spheres of debate raging right now. And they've probably uh, caused a little bit of, um, of the problems that my, myself and, and Dr. Dada are going to talk about with trust, that these debates have certainly not encouraged uh, uh, collaboration in a lot of these spheres. So that brings us to the next challenge, which is how do you estimate uh, human trafficking in the United States or around the world? And Dr. Dada is, uh, is, is uh, one of the world's um, um, experts in this. He's worked in several of the world's biggest projects attempting to estimate uh, prevalence. And so, um... Thank you, Dr. Spires. The, the last time we had a measure of slavery in the United States that was above board was back in the, the census of 1860. Um, and at that time, we knew that 25% uh, of Virginians owned another human being. Since then, uh, you know, since the end of the Civil War, slavery has been outlawed in the United States. And so slavery or human trafficking hides in plain sight. Um, what I think is interesting though, if you look at this map, of the United States, this is a superimposed map of the US interstate highway system. And you see essentially this grid of the highway system traversing throughout the United States. And especially with regard to the phenomenon of sex trafficking, all of these, in, these uh, interstate highway corridors are essentially corridors where criminal networks, uh, organized and disorganized criminal networks will traffic human beings. And so even here in Virginia, where we're, we're zooming from today, um, Interstate 64 intersects with Interstate 95. And by that reason alone, you have this geographic nexus point where people are trafficked, where people are bought and sold. And so this just gives us a little bit of a, a visualization of the scope and scale of human trafficking. But the, the problem, of course, is because human trafficking is illegal, it's a crime. And the only persons who truly know the enslaved numbers of individuals today are themselves the traffickers. Um, now, there is some research on uh, human trafficking. And there is one website that I uh, use called the National Human Trafficking Hotline. It's operated by an organization named Polaris. And Polaris uh, doesn't take a survey of human trafficking around the US, but they have a hotline and people call into the hotline reporting tips on what they think might be observed instances of sex trafficking. Or sometimes people, maybe they're, they're feeling a little concerned after they might see a television show or a movie about trafficking. And so you might get false positives or you might get um, things that are reported that, that are not necessarily so. But be that it may, as it may, uh, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center through its hotline in 2018, they fielded uh, 3,718 calls. And out of those calls, the most prevalent forms of sex trafficking were as follows. Trafficking in illicit massage, illicit massage spas, uh, residence-based commercial sex where there are homes or houses in a neighborhood where people are uh, sold for sex. Um, hotels, motels, um, 
through the world of pornography, through the world of online ads. Uh, these have been uh, ways that people have called in uh, reporting concerns of human trafficking. Um, in terms of the, the distribution or the spread of human trafficking around the United States and in terms of its, its, its uh, financial spread, um, you've probably heard a, a, a statistic that human trafficking is one of the world's most sort of lucrative businesses. Um, well, we're, we're not sure entirely on the numbers, but one excellent report out of the Urban Institute, a think tank based in Washington, D.C., uh, they did a study of eight major cities in the United States, uh, Atlanta, Miami, Seattle, DC, Dallas, San Diego, and Denver. Um, and they found that at least with regard to those cities, the commercial sex economy uh, in Atlanta and Miami, uh, you know, outstripped the, the underground economy of drugs and guns in those cities and was on par with other cities like a little bit more, well, in, in San Diego, uh, Sex trafficking was about the same uh, in terms of the market of drug trafficking. Um, and then other cities like Denver, it was a little bit lower um, compared to drugs and, and the sales of guns. Uh, but these data uh, are an excellent form of data showing that the, the illicit market for human beings uh, is lucrative. And, it, and it's not only that, it intersects of course with gangs and criminal networks that are selling not just drugs, but also guns. Um, a very, a very, very sad fact of human trafficking is you can sell a gun once, but you can sell a human being again and again and again. Um, and so there is, there is a twisted economic rationale for, for why trafficking can be so profitable and so lucrative. So who purchases sex? And there's a lot of cultural variation. Uh, this is an infographic. Um, from the Journal of Urban Health, and they did an excellent study looking at respondents in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and in Mexico, and comparing with respondents in Florida. And what you'll see uh, with respondents in Brazil in terms of men surveyed of who purchases sex, you'll see that a significant minority of persons in Brazil have done this, um, whereas in the United States, um, it's, it's a relatively a bit more conservative. And in Mexico, it's somewhere in between. And this is just simply to, to illustrate that there's cultural variations on how people interpret the purchase of sex. And there can be cultural variations on how people perceive other types of, 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 of modern slavery. The issue of forced marriage comes to mind. Um, in some parts of the world, it, it's given uh, to be somewhat of a cultural norm that a person might be married off early but in other countries that can be perceived as, as something highly offensive. Um, and at least according to the United Nations now um, is illegal. Um, so a little bit about trafficking around the world. Um, this is my friends, the proverbial needle in a haystack to be completely honest. The answer to the question of how many people are enslaved worldwide is we are not sure. Um, however, um, if we look at data from the International Labor Organization, the ILO, in 2005, or the ILO in 2012, um, and then other efforts from non-governmental organizations like the Walk Free Foundation in 2013, 2014, 2016, and then most recently, uh, a consortium of organizations called Alliance 8.7 in 2017, Estimates range from anywhere from 12 million persons estimated to be enslaved today, upwards of 40 million persons estimated to be enslaved. Um, each one of these numbers is subject to a lot of debate that we don't have time for. Um, but I think most experts would agree conservatively that there are millions of persons around the world who are being held against their will and essentially enslaved. Um, and just to give you another visualization of the phenomenon, uh, this is an estimate from 2018 of persons enslaved and it's a heat map. And what you'll see is there are disparities between estimated enslaved persons uh, regionally. Um, South Asia is known to be the, the biggest hub of enslavement with India. Some organizations estimate that half of the enslaved persons in the world today are in India um, or nearby in Pakistan or Bangladesh. Um, but then if you look at other countries like the United States, uh, some estimates are as low as maybe 10,000 persons uh, trapped in enslavement today. And, and some estimates are even 
wildly high as up to 400,000 people, which I, I don't agree with. Um, but for me, the tragedy of the situation is everybody knows slavery is wrong. Everybody knows slavery is illegal, and yet it continues. And I think that's the take home point of these estimates. As, as imperfect as they are, they substantiate the fact that we still have a long way to go in creating a world without slavery. Um, and then lastly, I think we've got a couple of more slides here. Uh, the phenomenon of child marriage. Uh, this is an estimate from UNICEF, which is a part of the United Nations. And according to their website, in a study of women around the world, ages 20 to 24, UNICEF estimates that 5% were married before age 15. And if you count that as part of the legal definition of forced marriage, then the numbers of enslaved persons just balloons upwards and upwards. So uh, you can see that this uh, becomes a very complex topic um, and a, a complex set of potential solutions. Uh, you've seen numbers about, uh, about commercial sex. Within commercial sex, how much of that is sex trafficking versus how much of that uh, is willing? All of a sudden, you are, uh, you are deep within one of the debates we've already talked about, right? Um, the next question is, uh, which of these approaches um, do you start on uh, to, to try to address the problem? In general, uh, all of the countries on earth through the Trafficking in Persons Report are measured on the first of those three, three Ps. Um, so they're kind of given a, a grade uh, by the State Department of the United States uh, on their, uh, their efforts in prevention, their efforts in protection, their efforts in pros prosecution. Uh, but you can imagine a lot of the work done by those governments is actually done in collaboration or just solely by nonprofits, civil society in those countries. And so uh, whether that's supported by the government or whether that's done through outside donors, very often you, you'll see um, uh, organizations biting off one of these approaches um, uh, because it is so massive. So my own experience in Cambodia is with uh, an organization that really focuses on prevention. Um, uh, through Love Without Boundaries, uh, I uh, had the privilege of helping to, to build a couple of schools on the border region with Thailand, where in these villages along the border, most parents were uh, either day laborers or long-term informal migrants into Thailand. And their children were very often left in the village uh, unsupervised. On both sides of the border then you have a situation that's kind of ripe for exploitation. You have undocumented informal migrants in Thailand um, working in rice fields in the seafood industry and construction very often uh, not being paid what they were promised or not paid at all, or the working conditions were not what was promised or forced into it once they began. And in the shrimping industry in Thailand is one very notorious um, set of cases where once the migrant, uh, was, uh, migrant laborer was on the boat, uh, they never saw the shore again and, uh, and maybe were at sea three, four years um, before they deceased. And so uh, my own firsthand experience would be with the Easel School and Lo Love Without Boundaries uh, working on the border to provide some, uh, number one, some protection and prevention of that exploitation by having schools where the children could feel safe during the day. Government schools uh, were not very reliable. Teachers uh, were charging fees. Um, and so having a school that provides a safe place during the day, provides food, which the government schools there don't do, and provides a place where the parents can know that when they're uh, across the border working, that they don't have to worry that their, their children are unsupervised uh, back in the village. Um, so that's just one of many examples of the, the way that um, prevention is done uh, uh, around the world. Um, the other uh, 
uh, facet of, of the four Ps is protection. Um, and one example of that is the work by the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking for CAST based in Southern California. And they provide legal services and referrals for health services and medical services to survivors of human trafficking who are identified either by CAST or by local law enforcement um, or other NGOs. And uh, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of uh, meeting with representatives from CAST and taking my students to visit CAST in Los Angeles. Um, and there's one example of uh, their, their approach that I, I just found admirable, but nonetheless somewhat uh, controversial or chilling where um, they are committed to the right of self-determination for uh, formerly enslaved persons. And sometimes, sometimes it happens to be the case, not always, uh, not, not oftentimes, but sometimes a person might be uh, uh, identified as an enslaved person who's able to be liberated. Maybe they're rescued by a neighbor or maybe by law enforcement, but we each have our own journey. We each have our own path. And from time to time, a person might willingly choose to return to that situation where they were harmed, where they were enslaved. Um, and caste has this non-paternalistic attitude where you wanna honor the sovereignty of an individual and let them choose their own life path. That's, that's probably one example of one NGO that might be protecting formerly enslaved persons. Other NGOs uh, often take maybe more of a uh, sometimes an extreme position where they, they insist that a person needs to be rescued and they know what's best for them. And sometimes that approach can be, I think, very compassionate, but nonetheless, perhaps a little, a little bit overly paternalistic. And that leads to the, the prosecu prosecution approach. You know, one great example in our area in Richmond is the Legal Aid Justice Center, um, who have an entire uh, subgroup that focuses on um, uh, trafficking cases. Most of their work is in rural parts of the state of Virginia, particularly Southwest Virginia and over on the Eastern shore. And they often, uh, most often work with migrant laborers who uh, uh, you know, are taking a seasonal migrant uh, laborer job on a farm, let's say, uh, but once they arrive, they're not allowed to leave. They're kept in very uh, uh, secluded uh, uh, conditions. Um, and there's sort of this company store approach where uh, the farmer or the, the labor broker is charge, oh, charging sort of exorbitant fees for food, for lodging, for these kinds of things. Often the migrant uh, laborers don't know how much they owe. Um, they often aren't allowed to see the ledger that is supposedly tracking the amount of money that they're indebted. Um, and so um, the Legal Aid Justice Center goes in uh, with a team of lawyers and social workers to, uh, to find these cases first. It's not just as simple as finding the case and prosecuting it, though, however, uh, just like Monty just mentioned, this, this issue of agency uh, becomes a very important piece because a trafficking case could take a year to two years through the court pro court proceedings and through that process. And you imagine a seasonal migrant laborer who really needs to be on the move uh, multiple times during the year to be able to, to, to survive. Um, it might not be in their best interest to stay in a, uh, let's say a shelter in Richmond uh, for two years waiting on uh, a trial. And so um, that's where this prosecution uh, approach has had many, many problems. Uh, there have been some changes, including allowing uh, video testimony of uh, survivors and things like that. Um, but it's still a major problem for anti-trafficking organizations and government uh, uh, organizations to really wrap their head around all of these. And then, so you can imagine why we're led then to this final approach, partnerships, right? That. Uh, uh, without partnerships, without a more integrated connection uh, across governmental, civil uh, society organizations, you're really not going to uh, get a, get through a lot of the complexity. So, Monty, do you want to mention the UNIAP uh, case? Yeah, in uh, Southeast Asia, the United Nations um, has uh, an organization, UNIAP, that liaises quarterly with local anti-slavery organizations around the region.
in Laos and, and Burma and Cambodia and Thailand. And they're brought together in a spirit of, of trust and cooperation. And, and I really have to just give props to Sebastian Boll, who leads these efforts of creating a space where people can share what's working well, what's working wrong, and how do we make it better? Um, because very often, a person who might be trafficked in Cambodia um, is making their way to Thailand, or somebody in Thailand made their way from Vietnam or the Philippines. And so there's a highly interconnected nature of trafficking. Um, and without partnership, uh, it, it, it's difficult to really manage this global, global uh, concern. So that brings us to our, our interest in um, trust is uh, that we have worked with and interfaced with quite a few anti-trafficking organizations, both government officials and uh, nonprofits. And one, one issue we continue to run up against is the lack of trust among organizations. Um, there's some reasons for that, right? The, the idea that uh, you're competing often for the same pots of money uh, regularly comes up between organizations that there's this sense of competition. So you wouldn't want to trust each other too much. Um, but then there's also the, the, the sense of trust out in the community, right? Whether people feel like they can trust the government, whether they can trust law enforcement, whether they can trust the local charities um, to actually solve the problem for them if they are running into issues or whether they don't feel that sense of trust. So that's really where we were, were, were starting. That was our springboard to really look, dig in, into this topic. And so um, uh, what Dr. Spires and I have done is we've partnered with a, an organization based in London, the Arise Foundation. And this, by the way, is a picture of uh, children in South Asia who are working on brick kilns and you might see a smokestack there in the horizon. And these brick kilns, they belch out the most noxious pollutant uh, things in the atmosphere uh, to manufacture these bricks. And there's a, there's a curious intersection between climate change and global warming and slave labor contributing to that very phenomenon. Uh, but me and Dr. Spires, we've partnered with the Arise Foundation and we said, you know what? Let's look at the data. Let's see if we can find a correlation between trust and human trafficking. What are we looking at with the numbers? And so we started here with the United States. And again, finding good data on anything in the anti-trafficking world is kind of like finding a needle on the haystack. But uh, me and Dr. Spires, we found some data on trust uh, from uh, a measurement called the Social Capital Index. And this is a, a shaded map of trust in the United States or social capital. Um, in the year 2018. And uh, this metric of social capital was a combination of attitudes about family, about community, about institutions, um, about collective effect efficacy. And you'll see that the, the darker shaded states are attributed um, with lesser trust and the lighter shaded states are attributed with higher levels of trust. And so we took that data and we correlated the data from the National Human Trafficking Resource Center that does that hotline. And admittedly, the hotline data are not, not perfect statistics. They're simply incidents that re were reported by concerned citizens. And we wanted to see, is there a relationship between trust and reports on human trafficking to the national hotline? And again, this is just a snapshot of data but very briefly, we, we found there was a correlation. Uh, we found that essentially um, those, country, those, those states that have higher levels of trust have lower reports of human trafficking, other things being equal. This is uh, statistically controlling for other factors that can predict human trafficking in America, things like homelessness, things like uh, poverty, things like uh, drug abuse things like uh, sexual assault. We, we threw in all of those other variables. And yet this measure of trust was what we call statistically significant, that this correlation wasn't due to random chance, but something else was going on. And that, that's begun to fuel the beginnings, the very beginnings of this research agenda that Dr. Spires and I are, are pursuing on looking at the intersection of trust and human trafficking. We hypothesize, um, that trust does matter, 
Uh, but we, we think that the study of trust and human trafficking um, could really benefit from knowledge and insights from uh, our colleagues at the CJP who are looking at things from the lens of restorative justice. Um, and so Dr. Spires, uh, I know you and I were gonna jump in for these next few slides, but let me invite you to jump in for the next part. Sure, yeah, so, so our, um, our, our concern, right, uh, is that the, the, uh, the issue of trust, right, is, 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 is tied up with a lot of other social issues. Uh, one, the sense that if you, uh, if you go to the police, right, and you report that you've been exploited, do you really believe that they're going to be able to restore that situation? Are you, are, is the problem going to be addressed or is the problem going to be ignored? And so the restorative justice lens brings so much to that, uh, that question that makes us want to, um, to dig deeper. And so again, uh, as, as uh, Monty mentioned, the, the idea being that we're, at, we're, at, we're just scratching the surface on this. We've, we've played with uh, quite a bit of other data related to trust and social capital, but we continue to want to dig into um, the topics of, uh, of, of uh, restorative justice. And, and so one example of, of you know, groundbreaking work that CJP has helped pioneer is coming to the table for restorative justice for those uh, descendants of sons and daughters of slaves and slaveholders. And yet we know, we know slavery or human trafficking has not ended today. And, and I think we can learn a lot from these initiatives of RJ and applying eventually reconciliation today between formerly enslaved persons and their, their offenders of, of all sorts of human trafficking, whether it's in the seafood industry or sexual uh, exploitation or in the agricultural industry or the textile industry or the, the steel industry. We, we think we can learn from these insights of RJ, but, but the human trafficking community um, is, is just barely, barely just beginning to have these discussions. Now, there are some legislative measures where Victims of trafficking will be re rewarded uh, compensatory damages, but but that's more in a legalistic sense of being granted a visa and and maybe some some financial resources. It's not face to face discussions that I think have been pioneered by by initiatives like coming to the table. That that maybe could maybe one you know could be one connection, um, and so we wonder might it be possible. For survivors of contemporary slavery to confront their offenders, and what can we learn from RJ about that? Um, there are criminal trials for human traffickers, but could there be other more potentially restorative methods for those persons who have been enslaved today who are, you know, quite frankly, uh, spending the rest of their lives trying to reclaim their, their, their humanity sometimes, their dignity, um, given the, the overwhelming levels of post-traumatic stress that survivors of trafficking experience. And, and uh, to piggyback on that, you know, oftentimes that um, uh, survivor agency um, is left out of the conversation, um, that it becomes, you know, uh, uh, joined up into the criminal justice system and that snowballs and it becomes this very bureaucratic and technical and carceral system, whereas uh, very not not often enough are the survivors uh, consulted about what do they want to do, right? What is it that you want out of this situation? Um, and uh, and and so we see that as number one, a major missing piece in the anti-trafficking world. Uh, but but uh, number two really probably a symptom of the fact that these organizations out there that work on this, these government entities, these nonprofits that work on these topics aren't communicating. They aren't coming together. They sort of have their, their uh, chosen solution and they're gonna go with it. That's what they've decided works best. And rather than having those collaborative conversations, which I think uh, the RJ community really does, that's sort of your bread and butter, right? Is, having honest conversations with people. Um, the the anti-trafficking community is not doing that uh, to the level that I think needs to happen. Um, and then lastly, I, I think we'd be remiss to say that I think one significant contribution uh, 
the human trafficking community could learn from the restorative justice community are programs like STAR, you know, where CJP has pioneered the, the methodology of thinking critically and systematically about strategies for trauma awareness and resilience. In the human trafficking world, we are, we have a long way to go in being able to create these spaces. Uh, I, I would say in the human trafficking community, best case scenario, we have brave spaces where sometimes people share what they really feel. But do we have safe spaces? Do we have restorative spaces? Do we have reparative spaces that I think have been modeled by the work of programs like CJP and STAR? No, and, and this is where I think the, the human trafficking community really can look for guidance from organizations like CJP and other peace builders who are much better informed and equipped to think about egregious human rights violations from the lens of, of repairing harms and being informed about trauma and how trauma is something that's not a quick fix. Um, shareholders or stakeholders sometimes in the anti-slavery world, you know, they feel they can throw a lot of money at the issue. And if we fund it enough and, and put enough money behind it, everything will be fixed. And I, and I think we can learn from the RJ community that things of human rights and things of the human heart, you know, are not necessarily a quick fix. And that, um, you know, really connects to those cultural differences as well, um, where in places that I'm the most familiar with, like in Southeast Asia, you know, often survivors don't want to necessarily be identified as having been exploited and then return to their home village, um, uh, essentially, you know, with this sort of sense of humiliation, this sense that you've disappointed your family, um, that you, you weren't able to get out and make a living for your family and support them. Rather, you were sort of, uh, you, uh, victimhood in itself is is uh, is sort of a, a dark cloud over your your life, and so those conversations um, are just not happening at the level that they should be in the anti-trafficking world. Rather, the conversations are often geared toward those debates that we've mentioned and the big players who de who define um, the, the the conversation, which are the United States Department of State major law enforcement organizations, right? Uh, they, they, there's a, an, there are incentives not to communicate because the incentives are really about, you know, how many arrests did you have? How many prosecutions did you have? Not, uh, well, and, and let's be honest, that, that, that uh, sells newspapers and makes, more, makes for more clicks on the internet. Whereas how many people you uh, prevented from, from uh, being exploited, or how many survivors you actually were able to help restore to, to, their, uh, to their, their, their previous sort of sense of self, um, that, that, that doesn't get the headlines in the, in, the, in the same way that a lot of anti-trafficking organizations are really searching for. Um, so that's, that's where we are in this world and why you can see why we need um, this, this connection. And so um, in closing, just some, some questions to throw out there are, you know, how can we provide a more trauma-informed approach to the study and world of anti-trafficking? How can we help survivors of human trafficking as well as activists feel more wellness? Um, Post-traumatic stress is, is everywhere in the, in the anti-trafficking community, but we barely address it. We barely talk about it. And finally, with my research with Dr. Spires, trust is not the norm in the human trafficking community. And yet we are confident that trust is one of the, the binding missing ingredients without which you're not gonna ever create a world without, without uh, you're never gonna create a world where slavery is no more. Um, and so we, we wanna learn, you know, we wanna know how do we grow trust from an RJ perspective and what can we do? Um, and that I, I believe my friends uh, brings us to the end of our, of our discussion. Um, and we thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was uh, really uh, informative and, and very powerful to, at least for me, I know, to get a little bit more of a glimpse. As you said at the very beginning, uh, this concept of human trafficking primarily comes at us through probably Hollywood and, uh, and news headlines. And very few of us know how to wrap our minds around what exactly we're talking about and so on.
I'm in, um, encouraging folks now in our, in our webinar audience to be thinking of questions. All questions are welcome. Uh, and uh, we would love to um, take those on. We have three significant questions right now that I'm gonna go ahead and, and pose uh, to our panelists and let's uh, begin this conversation. So um, the first one uh, is from uh, Amanda and um, it would seem prevention would be helpful, but also asking and getting answers to how and when did a person start prostituting and why. Knowing more will help us know answers, but also understanding why it takes building relationships to get to know these answers with truth would be necessary. So here's the question. Is there any work currently in place that reaches out to establish relationships and resources for those in the work? Any reports? In many ways, you got to that with trust. I, this might have been put out before you got to some of the trust work, but you might want to expand on that. And um, Sure, I can I can take uh, part of that, and I think uh, Monta, you can jump in after after me. Um, there there are several organizations out there. Um, one that's been around for a really long time in Southeast Asia uh, is called Empower, and they work with they're they're really a uh, they started in the eighties um, looking at the issue of uh, sex worker rights and what they uh, what they did in Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand, was. Uh, they, they, they went and asked, um, uh, you know, uh, sex workers, you know, what is it that, that you need? What is it that you want? And often what they said was that, you know, number one, not every one of us is trafficked. Um, certainly many of us are at uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged situations, but we find um, uh, just as much abuse from the law enforcement as we do, maybe even more than we do from customers. And so, um, and the reason being, uh, according to, to their own constituents, was that there is that sense that these people are doing something wrong and therefore the, the police had the right to, to abuse them however they felt because they were criminals. And so part of that fed just that attitude of prostitution equals uh, criminal um, fed that, those uh, additional abuses. So Empower is a really fascinating group that's been around now for uh, 30, 40 years. Um, another is, uh, th you know, there are quite a few organizations that work with, um, with, with, with women uh, or men who have been abused in the sex industry, have exited the sex industry or were forced into it. Um, yes, yeah, so there are quite a few, uh, but almost always those uh, reports are very small scale, um, very much typically case studies rather than sort of big broad studies of how um, how this stuff works. Yeah, and I'll um, I'll add on I think to what what uh, what Bob is sharing. Um, I think in so many ways in the anti trafficking sphere, we're still at the ground floor of of a research agenda, and there are so many things we're still learning. Um, one thing that encourages me is there, there are very uh, relatively new efforts among survivors of enslavement who've begun to self-organize. Um, the, the newest uh, organization I've heard is run by uh, a survivor named Min Dang. She's created her own NGO called Survivor Alliance and it's run by survivors uh, with survivors. Um, and it's very unique. There, there is another uh, national network uh, for survivors here in the United States, um, and it's a brilliant organization, but it, it's technically overseen by another NGO and is not autonomous. It doesn't have its own sovereignty, so to speak. Um, and, and I think what, what complicates things is that very often if somebody is coming out of enslavement, unless we, we hold them and, and help them, but ideally not with paternalism, they may very well fall back in. Um, sort of akin to the idea of if, if somebody's in incarceration, there might be recidivism. You sort of fall back to these patterns. And, and, and so the, the Survivor Alliance that I think is, is based out of the UK and the National uh, Survivor Network, they're, they're not more than a few years old. Um, and so we're at that, that, uh, at that level of newness or that level of nascency, 
in having these dialogues to sort of understand mm -hmm. what happened to you, how do you, how do we help, and and how do we do it in a way that really is enabling for the agency of that person who who was once enslaved. And I've got an example um, as well. One of my uh, one of my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Uh, Kevin Ming, did a lot of work in Guangzhou, China, with migrant sex workers. Um, and trafficking victims um, living in that southern part of China. And uh, they often uh, complained, right, that uh, anti-trafficking organizations would come in and say, hey, we're going to help you get out of prostitution and get to work in a legitimate job like a factory. And uh, all of those sex workers said, we've already worked in the factory. It was miserable. We hated life. At least we're making more money and we have a little bit more freedom. It's not, it's not great, but compared to what we were doing. So that uh, Western mindset or paternalistic mindset has driven so much of what we've done that we really haven't just gone out and asked people, you know, what, what is it that you would like to do? Uh, to, what can we do to help you um, change, change the path of your life? Um, that, that's, that's at the core of it, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and just to close that, um... You know, people mean really, really well. Um, there, there's a very famous journalist. Uh, he, he's written publicly about this now, Nicholas Kristof with the New York Times. Uh, he wrote a very famous book called Half the Sky. And the first part of the book is about human trafficking. And he shared that um, when he was in, in um, I believe it was in Southeast Asia, he felt the best thing to do was to, to buy somebody out of enslavement and free them, become their liberator. But what happened is, you know, because of life circumstances, this person returned to that very same situation. And so even with the best of intentions, we can fail miserably. And I, and I think that that's a, I think that's another area for the human trafficking community to begin to talk about. We don't talk about our failures because if we do, it can look bad for funders. And if it looks bad for funders, we're, we're not gonna cop out to our mistakes. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, there's. There is um, another question here, and then I'm going to return to um, some that I'll hopefully be able to put together here. Matthew um, puts this forward. Seems to me that most anti-slavery work seeks to be victim focused with the only option for engaging with perpetrators being prosecution mm -hmm. and incarceration. Given a restorative understanding of justice, is it likely that modern slavery will end without the perpetrators as well as the victims or as you survivors being freed. What alternative engagements with perpetrators might RJ suggest? Well, that's a great question. Um, and yes, you, I think you just zeroed in on one of those, uh, those issues is that uh, we tend to still have sort of a carceral mindset toward trafficking and uh, both Monty and I have spent a lot of time working with both, uh, both survivors and exploiters. And what you tend to find is that because this isn't, you know, the, the, the olden days of the sort of slave trader ships, right? And the bad guy being the obvious person, very often you'll find that someone who has exploited someone else uh, in terms of trafficking has been exploited themselves and are often more opportunistic, right? It's, it's sort of, I, I am taking advantage of this other person because that's, that's the option that I have in front of me. And so it really does mean a widespread uh, check shift in mindset. And right now, because the funding doesn't encourage that, it's gonna be a while before we get there. Um, the money is really not tied to that. It's really tied to uh, arrests and prosecutions and rescues. Um, and so it really is going to take a narrative shift. Yeah, it, it makes me wonder, um, you know, in some sense, to what extent is forgiveness necessary? We, we have victims and we have offenders. Um, and what becomes really, really complicating that Bob was, was talking about was sometimes the, victor, the victim does become the offender. Uh, in the world of sex trafficking, um, there, 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 there's, a, there's a phrase used of, of the, um, you know, sex trafficking is very, very gendered. And so typically uh, the female who's recruited first and then over time uh, learns the process becomes what we call the bottom. And that person who was once a victim is then recruiting others and under the eyes of the law is technically an offender. Mm 
but that that doesn't that doesn't really sit right when I, I think this continuum of victimization and being an offender is sometimes blurred. Uh, another point I want to make is is um, if we look at human trafficking from a, a narrative of supply and demand, uh, capitalism, and sort of you know looking at the need for forced labor or even the need for commercial sex, um, there have been some efforts to to uh, for for uh, purchasers of commercial sex. There are John schools, and uh, the idea is you educate and you inform this person um, rather than than giving them a criminal sentence to say, well, look, did you really know? that this person was underage? Were you aware of this? And for some organizations, uh, Henrico County here in, in the Richmond, Virginia area, I think has done a little bit of work with John schools. That can be an alternative rather than, than sending the purchaser of sex to jail. But at the same time, nationally, uh, law enforcement is still just beginning to understand that um, under the eyes of the law, if you're under 18 years old and you're being sold for commercial sex, you are inherently a victim under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. But a lot of law enforcement, they might through, um, you know, their, uh, their perspectives, they may see the, these uh, victims as, as offenders. Or I, I've even had law enforcement confide that maybe they think of, of female sex workers as, 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 as garbage. Um, and there, there, can be, there can be gender discrimination laced into this. I would like to believe ultimately that this is an issue of education and awareness and compassion, um, but, but I think that's overly simplistic when we think about the global uh, supply and demand of electronics, of textiles, of foodstuffs, that we as consumers of, of electronics, as consumers of seafood, we are a part of the supply chain of enslavement. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got to have those conversations but what, what multinational corporation is going to put on their website, we're a part of slavery and, and, and survive, survive that, that public relations press? Only when there's a scandal will, will a multinational corporation own up to something and then it'll, it'll quietly go away. But at the end of the day, we are to some extent complicit in, in this global crime. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would also add that um, you know, there have been numerous cases around the United States where trafficking, um, where, where the victim and the offender is, is very blurred. Um, for instance, there were rings um, uh, in my home state of, of Georgia in Atlanta where uh, labor brokers were going around, traffickers were going around to, um, uh, to areas that were known for uh, sort of homeless, uh, homeless people, houseless people offering them um, uh, a job off and, and giving them drugs, often uh, keeping them addicted to drugs and then not paying them. So by the end of this process, they've been trafficked, they've been essentially slave labor for someone, but they're also using illicit drugs. They're, um, they're guilty of some other crime um, as a victim. And that's not an uncommon narrative that we see in the, in the United States, whether it's someone who is forced into prostitution or whether it's a migrant laborer or something, oftentimes um, an, effective, uh, an effective exploiter is also going to try their best to make that victim uh, culpable uh, so that they have even less of an encouragement to go to the authorities or to report them because they're guilty of something as well. So it becomes really complicated. Um, and, and with that carceral mindset, right, when it's all about putting people in jail, um, we, we're gonna end up uh, missing, missing the big piece. Thank you. There has been a number of uh, inquiries or questions. Um, the one, the most straightforward uh, might be, um, are there any early identification, I'm assuming projects, programs mm -hmm. within schools? So that was triggered around the idea of schools where the children uh, you know, are, are, are gathered often or young people under age. And, and, so, and that's a place where there's a lot of time spent by children. And so the other question was around, uh, was more around the trust building um, aspect with children, uh, specifically um, you know, uh, when children come to, um, a teacher or the teacher has students who may have been engaged in this. What is the, uh, 
you know, are, what is the, how is the work of trust being built in, in that sort of setting, the educational setting? Uh, That's a great question. Um, so and this leads us into the trauma issues, which are, which are huge also uh, exactly. in this process. Uh, this kind of comes in two different directions, right? There are programs, the Richmond Justice Initiative actually is one organization that has a school curriculum for middle and high school uh, students that sort of sensitizes them to potential exploitation, a lot of things like cyber security and cyber safety. Um, but it also requires, you know, the teachers uh, being sensitive, uh, being, you know, caring. And when a student comes to them, um, it's not just about teaching students, you know, how to keep themselves safe, but it's also about sensitizing adults that when a student comes to you, um, you know, and, and there's some red flags going off, you need to report it to, to who you need to report it to and not just pretend like it's not, not an important. Yeah. yeah, I think that that speaks to our broader theme. Um, almost every survivor of human trafficking I've spent time with, um, more often than not, at the end of the discussion, you know, me and my class, we say, well, what can we do or what, what should we learn from this experience? And invariably, the answer is, I just wish somebody had bothered to, you know, check in and care. Um, and so there, there are people here in the United States who are under domestic servitude, they're, they're, they're house slaves. Uh, there are persons under sexual, um, there, there's residence-based commercial sex. Uh, one, one friend, um, one survivor of enslavement, her name is Maria Suarez, she was in uh, Los Angeles uh, as a domestic slave for six years. And there were neighbors who, who saw her and, and maybe they felt something was awkward, but nobody just bothered to follow up. Um, it's almost back to this idea of being one's brother's keeper, one's sister's keeper. Um, and in the educational setting, I, I think that's a core value that we can apply not, not just to victims of trafficking, but, but anybody who maybe isn't you know, doing their very best or who seems at risk, whether it's somebody who might be at risk for child abuse or other forms of exploitation. Mm. It's almost as if there, there's, a, there's a gap between action and empathy. And, and um, or another survivor I know, her name is Holly Austin Smith. Um, she wrote a book called Walking Prey and she was, you know, her parents were uh, abusing drugs and, and she didn't really have role models growing up. And so one day she was out on her own at a shopping mall as a teenager. And for the first time in her life, somebody said to her, my God, you look beautiful. And that was her trafficker. And he lured her in because of, of this need just to feel loved and included. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's an awareness issue, but, it, but it's also, I think, to some extent, also a compassion issue. Um, or, or it comes back to the idea of, of having values and we live by these values as good members of the community. Now that's easier said than done because we're all busier than anything, but um, these programs from the Rich and Justice Initiative or even the, the family of Frederick Douglass, the Frederick Douglass Foundation, they're, they're having these training programs. Um, and, and I think it's awareness and empathy um, and being willing to take that risk, being willing to make that call saying something feels wrong, being willing to go to that neighbor and say what's happening. Um, when for a lot of us, we, we don't act that way normally as a first resort. And, and to springboard off of that um, is that uh, Dr. Dada and I also have another uh, research project where we've looked at civic engagement mm -hmm. and compared that to the number of um, actual human trafficking cases that are reported to the FBI's uh, uniform crime re reporting statistics. And what we found was that when there's more civic engagement, more things like AmeriCorps and other organizations happening on the ground in communities, there's more eyes on the ground and, they, and, and more cases get reported, right? They, um, people actually see what's happening. Whereas just because the numbers aren't high in a place doesn't mean something's not happening. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, maybe there's a, there's a general sense of disconnection in that community and, and people just are looking the other way. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about trafficking, right? Trafficking's kind of one end of, of, of a continuum of, of, of 
thing problems, but the domestic violence, child abuse, all of those things, I think really are part of that same set of issues. Thank you so much. Um, this has been very informative and I think helpful to just begin a conversation. There's no easy answers and this is deep and, and um, uh, it, 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 yeah, it's deep. Uh, it's a deep subject matter that arouses a lot of um, concern and, and passion and compassion. Uh, in, and thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm, I'm as I think about restorative justice in, in this converse, in the mix of this conversation, um, thank you for the number of really rich questions that you asked at the end. And I think there's much to be in dialogue about, but I, I'm, I'm, I can't help but notice some of the uh, places where restorative justice is also popping up in conversation. Um, one of those is the violent extremism, the work of violent extremism and, and, and this sort of sense of after many years, as we are prone to do in a carceral or militarized um, global uh, society, there was this militarized response, this sort of militarized police response and then sort of the punishment response and, and finding that that has not been effective, which restorative justice critiques uh, in that, and then turning towards our concepts of not just combating violent extremism, but preventing and, uh, and, and or uh, transforming. And then that moves them to the, to move upstream, uh, so to speak, and look at community. And this is where it's so powerful to see you talk about trust and, and what you just mentioned in the civic connections and networking that are happening there. And, and it seems to me that, that you know, violent extremism is also understanding that to prevent, we need to start in that place of the community where the very individuals who may engage in, in these various forms of violence we're talking about are living and being raised and, and being connected or not connected in places like family and school and neighborhoods and religious uh, institutions and so on. And so um, this is one of the places where I think there's a lot of conversation to think about restorative justice and its practices and, and, and principles, because it often feels hard to understand where that would slot in post um, some of the carceral and militarized actions. And yet there is place, I think, along all of that continuum to have these conversations, but they are um, proving to be challenging conversations. Uh, I wonder if there's any comments. I'm, I'm also thinking of um, uh, your discussion around voluntary, uh, the sort of sense of the need for the, the politics of choice, not only with those who have survived and, and, and so on, but also um, the politics of choice around sort of, um, you know, uh, how do we get folks to, because vo volunteerism is important in restorative justice. We start with the premise of sort of, if, if no one's sort of naming the wrong, if no one's naming the, the, the harm, we don't have a process really to start, though we could step back and use education as a sort of form of bringing folks into that conversation. Um, and I'm thinking of, and, I'm, and his name is eluding me now, there's a gentleman that has, that has a, a, a powerful story. Uh, he's, in, he's in London, a powerful story of being one of these undercover sting operated uh, global cops that went in to try to break these human trafficking rings up and you know, was sort of, uh, and, and so on, and realized he was fighting against this huge system, turned around and began to move in a very different way, took an asset-based approach to approach companies, transnational, or uh, uh, companies uh, to look at how many of them are willing to say, we're gonna take an inventory of our whole company and try to steer clear of any um, human trafficking slave work in our products and, and in the so on. And um, he claims most of our clothing, probably 80% of what we're wearing right now uh, comes out of, 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 of slavery. Um, so he's started this movement called Slave Free Label. One, and, and through some of their marketing they've discovered or, or, or surveying, they've discovered most people would buy clothing if it was a label that said slave free, but sort of like um, trade free uh, food and other produce or something like that. So this is, there's some fascinating efforts at this, but I think it does take a mind shift really to look at this. Absolutely, and, and the, for, for us, right, we, we want this uh, to just be the beginning of a, of a longer conversation because I think that that's, um, that's needed is that uh, um, uh, CJP and 
uh, us as just individual academics um, need to continue to, to collaborate, continue to carry on those conversations and through that process, bring in as many more people as possible. Yeah, yeah um, I, I think with a community like CJP and the Zara Institute, um, what I feel grateful for is we have this body of wisdom of what works in creating more repair, less harm. Um, and then we have these egregious human rights issues, whether it's human trafficking or, or other things uh, like uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, you, you've got these horrific topics and, and we're, we're all just trying to get a handle on how to make the world you know, that, that better place. Um, and we can only do this if we work together. Um, Bob and I are scratching the surface, but um, for anybody watching this webinar, I, I think we'd be delighted to continue the dialogue because for us, what, we're gonna be researching this issue for the rest of our lives. Um, once you, you get involved in these movements, you don't leave these movements, um, but we, we have to elevate our game with deeper knowledge and deeper insights from places like the Zare Institute and, and other places where we can, we can figure out how to, how to cause the least amount of harm possible when trying to do what we think is right. And I think what we're seeing in much of the justice movements that are, that are becoming more and more prevalent and, that, uh, and I would include restorative justice as a movement and that's another conversations we've had before uh, on some of these webinars. But I think it's important to understand um, there's, a, there's part of that discussion of redefining justice and the cultural and attitude shift that needs to happen will be um, moving us away from a reliance on state and, and the state institutions that at many times have failed um, to understand uh, human behavior and what changes human behavior, especially in a punitive um, uh, carcerized or militarized um, state. And so that's the challenge is then shifting that power and work in, into the non-formal, if you will, as opposed to the formal and, and building that as a, as, a, as a preventative and asset-based approach to this work. Thank you so much for this conversation. And um, we're gonna have, you're gonna have a few last words. We're gonna close up now. Thank you for all the questions and for those who've been with us uh, in, this, in this conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Maggie now for just a few announcements and then we'll come back and close with a few final uh, words from our panelists. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Carl, and thank you to our presenters for that awesome discussion. Um, I do have a couple of announcements for us before we close. Um, first, thank you for joining us for our first webinar of the year. Um, please visit zare-institute.org for updates about our next webinar, uh, which will be in February. Next, the Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, otherwise known as STAR program, is designed for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. Currently, all STAR trainings are scheduled to meet online, and you can visit emu.edu slash cjp slash STAR um, for more information about upcoming sessions and registration. If you're interested in learning more about restorative justice, we have several opportunities for you to study at Eastern Mennonite University through graduate degrees and certificates, such as the RJ certificate, which is perfect for working professionals. EMU also offers studies that combine RJ and education or RJE. Students pursuing a master's in education can get a restorative justice and education concentration or similar to the previous slide, graduate certificates are also available for those interested in RJE. There are also master's degrees in conflict transformation, restorative justice, and the newly added program for transformational leadership. The curriculum is practice-based and ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen field. For more, in for more information, visit emu.edu slash cjp slash grad. And last but not least, the Zare Institute website is available as a source for upcoming events, resources, the schedule of upcoming webinars, and a repository for past webinars that are linked to YouTube. So the recording for tonight's webinar will be available early next week at zare-institute.org. This concludes my announcements. So back to you, Carl, with closing remarks. 
Thank you, Maggie. And uh, once again, we really appreciate each one who has joined us for this webinar and also our two panelists who have given um, their time to be with us and share um, their, their heart and purpose and work, um, which has been inspiring. I wonder if there, each of you, we have a few moments here, um, are welcome to make some final remarks that you might want to, to leave with our guests, I mean, with our, with our audience and participants. Well, we just uh, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk um, and connect. And so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we, we want, uh, as I said, this to be uh, the beginning of a conversation, not just a one-time thing. Um, and uh, we also want to just continue to build um, our, our connections to the Zare Institute and, um, uh, and, and just really enjoy following, following all of your good work. Yeah, um, I, I just want to again express gratitude for this opportunity um, to be connected to CJP and the Zara Institute. Carl, um, I'm a deep admirer of all you've accomplished over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to be in this space. Um, and it feels restoring to not be alone in this. Um, human rights work is hard and uh, we need more people with us together. So um, um, I'm grateful just to, to, to grow the partnership and as, as it unfolds. Thank you. And that would be mutual. Uh, so let's continue this conversation. And um, I heard a, a wonderful uh, invitation from Bob uh, that for those who were here and maybe others who weren't able to be here and would eventually watch this, feel free to be in touch with our panelists uh, to continue conversations that um, you feel are important that, that obviously weren't covered in this brief conversation around this very, very big topic. And so we continue to go forward, leaning into um, the better world we, we want to see, the more restorative uh, world of well-being that we imagine. Thank you for being part of that, that conversation. And um, We'll please for those who have been part of the participating audience and um, thank you again for your questions and your engagement and please be keeping an eye on our website. We will be uh, putting up the, um, the publicity for our upcoming webinars in the next three months very soon. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.